So hello everyone. Uh, my name is Ratna Bua. I'm calling from Auckland, New Zealand, and we're we're in the middle of our summer right now. Um, we're heading out of it into fall, and uh, it's morning here. I got a cup of coffee. Okay. Good morning. So the other side of the world. I'm Ratna Dharani, and I'm in South Wales in the UK, not far from Tiratan Loka, and it's evening. Right. And, and just in case people don't know, Ratnadarni, you're the uh, chair of the College of Public Preceptors. Uh-huh. And my beautiful assistant is one of my deputies, Ratnaviewha. So we're doing a double act today. And we're going to talk about the first of the, um, what is now the eight guidelines. So these are guidelines. They're just guidelines, but they're just um, suggestions of ways in which if you've if you're interested in being ordained into the Tri Ratna Buddhist order, there's a training system and part of it is um, linking up with order members and doing study and things like that. But along the way, um, it's quite handy to have ways to review how it's going. So we're going to talk today about the first guideline. We're going to be talking about whether we're going for refuge sincerely and effectively. Um, you were going to say a bit about what we mean by sincerely going for refuge and the three jewels. Do you want to just fill that in, Ratna Viewer? Yeah, I was, I was just thinking back to when I first got involved and as a, you know, it was at Aria Loka in the United States. And, um, and I can remember just being in a, a beginner's class and hearing about the, the complementarity of wisdom and compassion being two sides of the same coin. And it just, a light went on. I just remember just like it was one of those light bulb moments. We talked about that, um, you know, when we were talking, reflecting on what we were going to say today. And uh, it, it's very much like in the Pali Canon where, where people say after they've heard the Buddha uh, teach the Dharma, you know, that, that there's light been brought into some place that was dark or that something that was knocked over was set right. Uh, or you've, you've been shown the road when you're lost or something that's been hidden or that was hidden to you has been revealed. It just felt like that. I, I felt like I had this upsurge of faith. I, I sort of realized that, that this, this is what I believe, that this, this is what I believe in words better than I could ever say myself. And, and it was, that, it was that, that, that feeling of like, I had a friend say this to me once, that once you've accepted that enlightenment is possible, how could you do anything other than try to achieve it? Mm. And, and I just thought, mate, you're a friend of mine. I'm going to get to know you because I like you. Mm. And I think that's, that was a sincerity for me. It was just like trying to maintain that through time, trying to deepen that, expand it, broaden it. Um, yeah. Mm. That's a lovely way of putting it. It's almost like... Um, that saying that you can remember where you were when um, we can probably all remember when that light bulb moment happened and um, it's like it's like everything shifts subtly at that point and as you say it's hard to imagine it not continuing or it's hard to imagine ignoring that it's like yeah. you know something um, yeah. that you almost like you always knew it but it suddenly makes sense and you start meeting people I think that's the Sangha aspect of it you you're meeting people who are talking about the same kind of experience and um that's a very strong and important resonance to have that with other people in the Sangha mm -hmm. it's a very tender process sharing your deepest highest wishes and inspiration with other other people for the especially for the first time and um you have to really trust people and you have to really be willing to show yourself and uh hopefully it's a mutual thing so it's not just you exposing yourself but it's i think when you first start doing it it is quite tender and especially if there's a sense that you're doing that with an order member who is somehow then gonna assess you in some way it's quite tricky especially when you're moving yourself you're moving into new territory and you're not really sure you don't really know what it means to be effectively going for refuge. You're, you're kind of feeling your way. But I remember being going for a walk with my potential private preceptor and um, having a go at describing why I thought I was possibly ready for ordination. And um, 
it felt terrible. And uh, afterwards, I just said to her, could you just just forget that? Just just forget it. And she said, um, so you don't want to be ordained then? And I said, no, I do want to be ordained. But however I was saying it just wasn't right. And um, so let's just start again tomorrow. So the next day we had a very short walk and um, I, I tried to be just absolutely honest. And I just told her what I thought, where I, th as far as I was aware, what made sense to me. And I, I found myself saying that um, all I could say was that when I'd first come across the Dharma, as you were saying, I'd had a light bulb moment, you know, I'd, the Dharma had made sense to me and I felt as though I'd tried to practice in line with the Dharma ever since. And I assumed I would carry on. I saw no reason why I wouldn't carry on indefinitely. So that was all I could say. And I didn't actually think it was enough. I didn't think it was good enough to get me ordained. Um, but she, I remember her saying, well, that sounds better. <laughs> <laughs> I did get ordained. Um, but I think I, I remember it was quite important for me because I was actually expressing confidence in my own practice and um, my own commitment um, in my own words, in my own way. And um, yeah, that was quite a, a significant moment for me. I think what we're talking about when that light bulb goes on is um, you start to make sense of things in a different way. Um, you start to fall back on, on what you're getting to know about the Dharma. And it is a moment of faith, as you said, a moment of realizing it's possible to be completely different and it's possible to be free and it's possible to be wise and compassionate. And, hmm. and, and, and what I found is that, um, you know, my, my initial connection was, was a flash. But but I but I had to keep uh, going back and tasting it and and almost like kneading it like bread. I needed to keep working it. I needed to keep uh, well. Also, I needed to let go of it too. You know, I mean, that's been one of my big lessons is to step back and and make an effort towards patience and spaciousness and like doing nothing. Mm. You know, you know that's that's a real yeah. effort for me. But the idea is that you can take this spark. And then you can surround it by the conditions by which it can come into a fire, you could say. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so like, what are the conditions you need to turn that that sincerity, that spark of of kind of connection, into something that's more robust, more more continuous, uh, more uh, pervasive in your life? Mm -hmm. um, you know. As I think it says in the guideline, is the thing about taking. Dharma practice into every area of one's life so that you're not living a compartmentalized life. So I think that's probably part of the thing about conditions that if there are some, some aspects of one's life where it's really hard to practice, then that's something to look at. Um, but I think it's important as well to remember that uh, tricky conditions are not necessarily bad, but sometimes it's quite a stimulus to practice. The most, the most progress I've ever made in my spiritual price, uh, practice was during very challenging conditions. It, it was mm -hmm. when I was really up against it and none of, my, none of my natural strengths were any good. They weren't any use at all. Um, I was, um, yeah, and, and I had to dig deeper and I had to kind of broaden in ways that, that were not um, natural for me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it was, it was revolutionary. I think it changed my practice. And I'm very, I'm very grateful for those times in a, in a weird sort of way, you know, you don't, you don't want to go through them, but uh, you're grateful for the healing, I guess mm. you could say that mm. results. I've just been polishing some pieces of driftwood and, uh, and, and you know, find wood on, the, on trails in New Zealand, um, a hardwood called cowrie. And it's been, they've used it as planks across the trail to, uh, when the trail's boggy, that the planks kind of help keep some substance there during the wet season. And those planks have probably been there for a hundred years and they've absorbed the mud and they've broken apart. So you can find these bits of them, but the bits are all kind of like worn down a bit like, a bit like driftwood, but, um, but along a trail. And, um, and I've just been sanding them down. They, they say that with wood, it sort of, it sort of reveals its form. It's got its own 
it's it's I don't know. I guess it's the whole sculpture thing, you know, that there's there's form within within it that that mm -hmm. you know what your job is is just to reveal that beauty. So mm -hmm. I've just been taking to sanding and polishing and oiling them down as a bit of a a kind of a a kind mm -hmm. of a mindfulness practice. Can you show us one? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good because we're going over time, so maybe this will get cut. So, maybe not. but but this is this is one piece that I've been doing. But I guess I, I guess maybe what's the connection here? I guess the connection is that that we don't know where we're going, do we? You know, like for me, I need to have something in my hand and I need to be working it. In a similar way with my spiritual life, I, I need to have it in hand. It's like I, I figure it out by, by having it in hand and living it out. And, mm -hmm. and going for refuge is a bit like that. You, you, you're, you're, you need to have that artistic, creative urge and that openness to what is and what could be different. And mm -hmm. you have it to hand and you just let it, you're just trying to reveal something that's already there. You're trying to reveal a beauty that's already there. Um, and that that takes a lot of faith. Um, and yet you have that, you have that kind of that feeling inside yourself that, that you know, you you feel it. You feel it. You resonate with the Buddha. You resonate with the three jewels. Okay. And your whole life is encompassing that. And it's got to include all of you. It's got to include different bits of you. So the bit that meditates, the bit that studies, the bit that sits doing admin work and finances, and then the bit that works with wood. And it's yeah. all, all going in the same direction, but very, very different qualities of unfolding exploration. Yeah. And it's that, it's that kind of uh, starting to walk that path when mm. when when you've got a shared um, shared ideals, shared values, which are the three jewels, they sort of they they are the uh, they're the common language. There's the shared language that we all have, and mm. so as we start talking about our path, um, you know, uh, our, our languages will will converge in a way. We start to understand words the same way. We start to understand experiences similarly, and uh, you know, I mean, going for refuge is the central act. Um, of a Buddhist. I mean, that's one of the things that, uh, that Sangharachita gave us. And I think that's a, it was a beautiful gift, you know, it unifies the Buddhist tradition and it unifies all of us. And, uh, and I think it's true. Mm. I think it's very, very um, true. There are some wonderful moments, aren't there? When you're, you're having a, an exploration with another member of the Sangha and it's ethically clean and it's sensitive and it's meaningful and um, you just have very very you can't you can't make make moments happen but they do become brighter and um, more common and more enjoyable and you can there's something about the, the the barriers you know the the natural defensiveness and the natural isolation from other people just starting to find your way through that and make connection more deeply with with the dharma as a tool it's um it's a it's a very wonderful thing to be able to do so thanks thanks that was great just having a conversation about that hopefully other people will get something out of it we've certainly not done it all in this short video so um it's just a a few thoughts that we had um over the course of 24 hours or so and um hopefully it'll spark off things for other people yeah. Yep. yep. Well, well, thank you very much, Ratna Dharani, and uh, hope you have a good night's sleep. Thanks, Ratna Viewer. Thank you.